This video covers accounting for equity transactions, and we're just going to go through examples here. We'll go through an example of an equity issuance, the journal entries there. We'll go through an example of treasury stock, that's when a company repurchases its own stock, and then sometimes they resell it again into the market. Third, we'll go through an example of dividends. And fourth, we'll talk about stock-based compensation, and we'll talk about the journal entries involved there. And we're going to pretend in this video that we are FactSet. FactSet is a company, it's a public company, and they provide uh, data and information to investors. And so that's what we use FactSet as our example. First, let's talk about equity issuance. And we'll go through an example of FactSet issuing new equity. So they want to raise equity capital. They're ready to bring in new owners to the business, and they want to raise equity capital. So FactSet issues 1 million brand new shares for $100 each. And by the way, the common stock par value is $1 per share. Now this idea of par value is really not important at all. Um, it shows up on the balance sheet, but it's just kind of a quirky feature of how we account for equity. Um, and you'll see that it doesn't have any really significant substance to it. But it's a fact, so the common stock's par value, company has to decide what's our par value. And fact set, we're going to assume, has a par value of $1 per share. Okay, let's talk about this equity issuance. The proceeds to fact set, they're going to get $100 per share. That's their raising capital. Every share that they issue, they get $100. They issue a million shares, so they get $100 million. Now here comes the par value part. We're going to split that $100 million of proceeds into two parts. The par value and anything additional above par value. So the par value is $1 million. That's just $100. Uh, oh, sorry, that's just $1 times 1 million shares. And so $1 times 1 million shares means $1 million is the par value. Anything over and above that, which is the 99 million remaining, is APIC. So here's what the journal entry looks like. It's a debit to cash of 100 million, that's how much money we're raising, and it's a credit to two different accounts. So the par value is gonna go into the common stock account. And anything above par goes into the APIC account, okay? This is just a fact. This is how accountants deal with it. So whenever you see the uh, common stock account on a company's balance sheet, you'll know that the balance in that account just reflects the number of shares issued times the par value of that share. So in FactSet's case, the common stock account would say a million dollars in it. You would know that FactSet's par value is one dollar. So you'd be able to calculate for yourself that there's a million shares issued in that uh, the, of FactSet. So that's kind of the, the way I see the par, uh, the common stock account on the balance sheet. But it's not super important for purposes of this class. Okay, that's it. That's it for the equity issuance, and now let's move on to the next type of transaction, which is treasury stock. Treasury stock is when a company purchases its own shares. So they've already issued the shares, but then they're going to repurchase those shares back from the market. So let's go through this. FactSet repurchases two shares. So this is a pretty small repurchase, two shares. They're going to pay $150 per share to do the repurchase. Well, two shares times $150 each is $300. We're going to debit the treasury stock account in credit cash for $300. Now, this treasury stock account is an equity account, as you can see here. But typical equity accounts, if you remember, have credit balances. Treasury stock has a debit balance. That's because we bought the shares back. So it's holding a debit balance, even though it's sitting in the equity section of the balance sheet. Okay, that's what happens when the repurchase uh, it occurs. Now let's talk about if we resell some of these treasury shares. So first, let's suppose that FactSet's going to resell one of those shares for $200. Well, $200, that's more than $150. This is kind of a gain, isn't it, of $50. The company is $50 richer thanks to doing this little stock transaction. The key for accounting purposes, though, is that we don't let that gain go to the income statement. We don't want managers of our company to just be speculating in our company's stock. We want them to be managing the operations of the business, growing the customer base, and that kind of thing. So we don't let that $50 gain show up on the income statement. Here's how we handle it with a journal entry. First, we debit cash for $200 because we're reselling the share and we're getting $200 into the business. Next, we credit the treasury stock account, but it's for $150. 
That's because this treasury stock account is accounted for at cost. We want to take whatever it costs that treasury share to go into the treasury account, that's the amount that we take out of the treasury account when we sell it. And to balance this journal entry, we balance it with additional paid in capital account. So this journal entry needed a credit of $50, and that credit is to the additional paid in capital account. Okay, now let's suppose Faxet resells that second share for $100 this time. So selling it for $100, that's kind of a $50 loss for speculating in its own shares. And it's a debit to the cash account of $100. Again, we're taking it out of the treasury stock account for $150 for the same reason. You take treasury stock out of that treasury stock account at what it costs you to put it in there. The reason is, once there's zero shares that we have in treasury, we want the treasury stock account to have zero dollars in it. So now that we've we put $300 in it to begin with, we've taken $300 out of it, now it's at zero, which makes sense because we don't have any treasury shares left. Okay, and again, to balance this journal entry, we need a debit of $50, and that debit is going to be the additional paid-in capital equity account. So what, what are we not doing in this second journal entry? We're not debiting a loss account on the income statement because we don't want these equity transactions in general to show up on the income statement. Okay, great, so that was the uh, treasury stock process. And let me show you what treasury stock looks like on the balance sheet. So here's the stockholders equity section of FactSet's balance sheet. Uh, they don't have any preferred stock anymore, but they do have common stock. And actually, their common stock is a one cent par value. One cent is the actual par value of FactSet stock. Um, and so this is the common stock account, and in here is just going to be all the par value. So you take the par value, you multiply it by the number of shares issued, and you get the balance in the account. Okay, next, we'll talk about the additional paid in capital account, which is right here. And next, the treasury stock account, which is right here. And you can see that the treasury stock account is holding a negative balance here. Now, negative, when it's in the equity section of the balance sheet, that just means debit. See, all these balances up here are credits. This is a credit. I guess this accumulated other comprehensive loss, that's a debit. But the, anyway, the treasury stock account here has a debit balance. And next one down is retained earnings. So we're familiar with retained earnings. Uh, that increases with net income and decreases with dividends uh, declared. And the accumulated other comprehensive loss account, we learned about that account in one of our topics, which was the investment topic. So accounting for available for sale debt investments, sometimes you'll have unrealized gains and losses going into this accumulated other comprehensive income or loss account. And that's total stockholders equity. Okay, so that's just kind of going through it. And in particular, I wanted to point out the treasury stock account. So moving on to the next type of transaction, we're going to talk about dividends. Suppose FactSet declares a total dividend of $1 million, and the word here is declare, so FactSet is declaring. What is a declaration? Well, they just promise. They say, hey, investors out there, we're going to get, our, we're going to get it put together, but we're declaring now a $1 million dividend, so get ready to receive that $1 million dividend. So when they declare it, they put it into a liability account. They credit dividends payable. That's because now they have the obligation to pay this dividend. And also when they declare it, they reduce retained earnings. So we're going to take some of those earnings and we're going to pay it out in the form of a dividend. So we're reducing retained earnings with a debit. Finally, uh, the easy part, FactSet pays the dividend of $1 million. So in this journal entry, cash goes off of the balance sheet. It also goes out of our bank account for $1 million. That's a credit to cash, and then a debit to dividends payable, reducing it to zero, because now we've settled our obligation. And that's it, that's accounting for dividends. Now let's talk about accounting for stock-based compensation. Okay, so here we'll go through it just step by step. FactSet is gonna grant stock compensation to employees. What is stock compensation? Well, rather than paying our employees salaries or cash, or, you know, that kind of thing, we're going to pay our employees in ownership in the business. So, hey, if you work hard for three years, you can own a part of the business. That's stock compensation. Okay, so what does the accountant do when the company grants stock compensation? 
the company says, okay, you've granted that compensation to employees. What is the value of what you just granted to employees? What is the dollar value? And there are a couple techniques that accountants use to do this. We're going to simplify and just say that they've already done it. And they've decided that the fair value of this total compensation to employees is $3 million. Next, you need to know the vesting period of the compensation. Vesting period means, okay, we're going to, instead of paying you cash, we're going to pay you ownership in the business. But you don't get it right now. You need to sit in your chair and add value to this business over three years. Then you get ownership in the business. So that is the vesting period of the stock compensation. Okay, once the accountant knows these two facts, fair value of $3 million, vesting over three years, what the accountant is going to do is charge this value to the income statement as an expense evenly over the three years. So it's a debit to compensation expense. Now, what is the credit here? We are not paying employees in cash, so it's not a credit to cash. We do not owe the employees any cash in the future. So it's not a credit to any liability account. This is just an equity transaction. So while the debit is to compensation expense, the credit is kind of going into equity's version of a flush, slush fund, which is the APIC account. So we are just going to put this credit into the APIC account of $1 million. So a credit to the APIC account is going to increase total equity on the balance sheet. But what is compensation expense going to do? It's going to get closed into retained earnings, and it's going to reduce retained earnings. So while the APIC account is going up by $1 million, the retained earnings account is going down by $1 million, and the net effect in year one here is zero on the equity section of the balance sheet. Okay, so that's the journal entry, and we're going to make that journal entry every year. So in year two, as the employee earns another third of that, of that stock comp, we're going to debit compensation expense a million and credit APIC a million. And we'll do the same thing in the third year. So by the end of it, we've recognized the total fair value into the income statement. We've recognized $3 million. And our APIC is also $3 million higher. Now, what was the point of doing this? Why is it important to have compensation expense on the income statement? Well, if you're not an employee, if you're just an investor in FactSet, you kind of want to know about this. How much stock are you giving away to your employees? Because once they give new stock to employees, that is diluting all of the other owners. In other words, if you give, give some stock to an employee, all of the other owners now own a smaller percentage of that company. So we make investors aware of this fact by charging the value we think that uh, stock compensation is to compensation expense on the income statement. So that makes investors aware of the uh, expense to them of giving up some of the ownership in the business. Great, so we've gone through the vesting period of this stock compensation. Now let's get to the time when the employee actually gets to benefit from these stock grants. So we'll talk about two different types of stock-based compensation. First, we'll talk about a stock option. And here we'll say the employee, employee is going to exercise one stock option for $100. So this $100 is sometimes called the strike price. And why is this called an option? Because after that three-year period, the employee has the option to exercise this uh, stock compensation. The option is, hey, you can have a share of FactSet, and all you have to pay is $100. When would the employee exercise the stock option? Well, if the uh, stock price of FactSet has gone up since uh, the date of the grant, this stock option is going to be in the money. It's called in the money. So the employee will exercise the stock option and get something worth more than $100 by paying $100. Okay, so that's the economic situation. And when the employee does this exercise, they're actually paying $100. And they pay $100 to us, FactSet. We get $100 in cash and we give the employee a share. So this is kind of like a stock issuance. It's a debit to cash for the proceeds. And then it's a credit to the common stock and APIC account. What goes into the common stock account? Well, the par value of that share, which we assumed was $1. So the par value of the share goes into common stock, and everything else, $99, goes into the APIC equity account. Okay, that's a stock option. Now let's talk about restricted stock. Restricted stock is a little simpler because restricted stock doesn't give the employee an option. At the end of three years, the employee just gets a share. So now there's a new share out there. That employee has that share now. 
So we need to make sure our common stock account reflects the fact that there's one more share out there. So all we do is re reclassify uh, $1, which is the par value of the stock. We just reclassify $1 from the APIC account into the common stock account. There's no effect on total equity. The only reason we did that was so an investor can look at the common stock account, divide it by par value, and know how many shares of stock are out there. Okay, so those are the two different main types of stock compensation that you'll see out there. So just to recap, we went through uh, a bunch of journal entries for these four types of transactions, equity issuances, treasury stock, dividends, and stock-based compensation. And we learned that generally equity transactions stay off of the income statement. We don't want any gains or losses that result from equity transactions to show up in the income statement because we don't want our managers focused on speculating in their own stock. So we keep them off the income statement, and usually those gains and losses, whatever they are, just go straight to the APIC account. The one exception there is stock-based compensation expense, because we want investors to know if they're being diluted in the business by giving some ownership to employees. So that's the one exception uh, to this general rule.